Hello, everybody, and welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators. We've all illustrated for all the major publications in the business. Together, we publish somewhere around 75 children's books, and we've all taught illustration at university art schools. Now, sometimes we argue, sometimes we agree. But most importantly, we're probably going to learn something today. <laughs> All right. That's pretty good. That was pretty, pretty You know good. what? Maybe you could replace Lee. Yeah. And your name could be Anthony. Lee. <laughs> oh, I have replaced Lee because he's not here. <laughs> we have a special uh, uh, re- uh, sit-in replacement for Lee White, who is on vacation. He scheduled a vacation during podcast recording time. Can you believe it? I can't. But more um, importantly, we have to tell his story. I, I'm, we're going to let him tell his story when he gets, okay. when he gets home because he'll tell he it has better. A vacation story. He, yeah, he has a vacation story. It's It'll a, take one too of those. Long if he does it, we you can know that, chill it. Yeah, you know that old. Uh, I think it's a Chinese pro, not proverb, but like a Chinese um, story lesson where it's like. The old farmer uh, found a horse in his field, a new horse, and his neighbor's like, oh, that's such a great thing. He's all, well, it might be good, might be bad. And then it turns out that his son rides the horse, falls off, and breaks his leg. Right, so it was bad. And his neighbor's like, oh, that's horrible. Oh, it might be good, might be bad. And then uh, the army comes, and they start recruiting people or enlisting people. uh, Not enlisting. um, What's it called? Drafting, Drafting. Drafting people into the war. And they can't take his son because he's got a broken leg. And his neighbor's like, oh, that's great. You you totally lucked out. And he's like, oh, it might be good, might be bad. And then I don't, the, the horse sleeps with his wife or something. And he's like, no, wait, that's not how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm sorry. That is so unlike me to have gone there. But what I'm trying to say is Lee had one of these stories for his vacation. And uh, we'll wait till he's back for him to for him to tell it. Uh, and I he's just still want to hear vacations. the story from the horse's perspective. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. it's like I'm just, I'm just trying to, just trying to live my life here. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> we have a special guest filling in for Lee today. His name's Anthony Wheeler. You might remember him from uh, episode. I'm going to pull Whatever it up here. It was. Well, the, the good one, the one that you one. said had so many views that it broke the all-time third point perspective. It broke record. the algo. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. I like how you you switch it to third point perspective. <laughs> no, I, it came out and it <laughs> sounded so wrong. Uh, episode one thirty four. So go back and check out Anthony Wheeler's episode, and it's a good one for uh, those of us in the in the audience here who are wanting to know how do you how do you make an art career as a, like a second career after you've already had a, another career as an old, um, disgusting 40 year old. Right, right, right. Yep. That's me. Old, disgusting. Okay. <laughs> so what are we going to do today? We've got some, well, first off, happy new year, everybody. Hopefully you finished your festivities in a, on a high note. Hopefully 2022 was a uh, awesome year for you. If not, I'm hoping that 2023 is off to a great start. What? How's your 2023 going, you two? It's amazing. Actually. <laughs> I uh, I won the lottery. I never played the lottery, but <laughs> okay, we'll <laughs> be facetious there, and maybe that was a is, a is a bad question. We're actually recording this before the new year, so we have no <laughs> idea what happened. We have no idea how 2022 ended up. Hopefully, we're yeah. all still here. Uh, that there hasn't been some sort of nuclear holocaust. <laughs> what Ukraine, is this episode? Ukraine, <laughs> Ukraine got what are we out. doing? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah. So let's uh, let's get right down into it. I well, let, well, before we get into it, I just want to ask you guys what what is one thing you want you were excited and happy that you accomplished in 2022, and what's one thing that you're like really looking forward to do in in 2023. Uh, I, while you're thinking about that, I, for me, 2022 was the year I got back to doing comics. I did, I drew maybe finished 50 
pages of comics. No, no, 60, so over 60 pages of comics, which for comic, for full-time comics professional, that's not a lot. But for me, who's doing it on the side, um, I'm really proud of that because the previous two years before that, it was maybe 12 pages total. So uh, I came out with Redshift Renegades issue one. I came out with the Spaceships book, which had 24 Mm -hmm. pages of comics in it. And I did a little like one shot, like mini book of the Redshift Renegades as well. So I'm really happy with that. And I'm hoping for 2023 to launch a Redshift Renegades Kickstarter, uh, which will collect the uh the rest of that story that i started last year so that's that's where i'm at that's that's kind of where my head's at that's awesome go ahead anthony oh i'll I'll go (laughs) yeah um i am excited because my pickleball paul children's book indie children's book is now on amazon that's awesome hopefully Hopefully. <laughs> That's what you're working towards. Working towards. Yeah. For sure. That's and, cool. And it could be it could be there right now. I of Tell course me. don't know. Yeah. And because... and the, this pickleball what's a pickleball Paul? Mm-hmm. Um this what was the idea there? Where this how did this come about? That's a long story. However Okay, forget it. Um, um, I played Anthony. No, I'll, I'll make this short the short <laughs> version is I love pickleball. We we play uh-huh. every night and sometimes in the mornings, and um, there's the, there's a need for that, that's a really uh, untapped niche um, mm-hmm. in the in the children's book world, and it's a niche that uh, I doubt the major publishers are going to care about or touch anytime soon, because mm-hmm. they shoot for the masses, and this is directed towards grandparents. A lot of grandparents play pickleball. Mm-hmm. I want them to buy this for their grandchildren. Very cool. So well, I hope 2023, your heartwarming story, number one in the pickleball section on Amazon. It's a very strong I, section on Amazon, in fact. It's not. And that's why I'm going there. <laughs> yeah. I'll it tell you, every not. my reward for a good day or a good morning's work is to go to the gym at about 11, 1130 every morning. And uh, we have a thriving pickleball community where I live. Thriving we're talking mm-hmm. 30, 40 people playing every time I go to the gym. Mm-hmm. That's incredible. It, it's yeah. incredible. I love it. And there's what? more energy in that gym at that time than any other point during the day. Yeah. Man, now, do you play? I wish I was a paddle maker. Yeah. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I've played. Uh, it's uh, When I get into the gym, I'm trying to get in and get out so I can get back and get uh, get to work. Okay. Um, but yeah, I have. Uh, I, we have four paddles and all sorts of pickleballs and stuff like that. So we played a bunch. Cool. Cool. All right. What about for you, Anthony? Yeah. So 2022 was a, was a really huge year. So this was the, uh, uh, the year that my wife officially quit her day job to help support what I do in illustration. Um, so that was a a massive paradigm shift for us. I taught myself how to, um, paint digitally. There was a big gap Mm -hmm. in my skill set for years. Uh, I had always just been a traditional illustrator, so so learning digital art was huge. Uh, I started a, a really thriving streaming practice, and we talked a little bit about on the most important podcast episode that you guys have ever recorded. Uh, <laughs> 131, I think, was the episode, or somewhere around in there. Um, launched a, uh, uh, launched a webcomic for a huge video game publisher, and that's been super successful and really fun. Uh, dig- did that all digitally, too. Um, this year, this year really needs to be a big shift in terms of, uh, so all of that stuff has been really great. Um, but I, I really set out to do picture books and children books and, and have sort of a, uh, a really thriving career in kid lit. Um, so this is the year where I think all of that comes together and that's, that's really what I'm pushing towards right now. Nice. Cool. Cool. We should we should have you on the first episode of every year just to just to see how you're doing. Maybe that's what we'll do. Just that, least... just just once a year. Just, Listen, just once? Lee hasn't left us he's permanently. He's just he's on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Lee's gonna uh, Fine. you know have a mysterious to uh, reaction to to his coffee when he gets back. 
<laughs> and uh, Anthony will have this strange alibi. You know, he'll be mm-hmm. sending us photos of him, you know, hiking on a mountaintop. <laughs> <laughs> He does live down the road from me. I can make this happen. Audience, know, let us right. know in the comments, however you comment on these episodes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. We have three you questions to, You today. should go to Lee's house when we're recording the podcast and just stick your head in there. <laughs> just stick your head in. Okay. okay. Um, we got three questions today we want to tackle. And the first one comes from Michael, or no, Micah. He said, should a print fesh- uh, professional handle it? Did I say that right? Should a print professional handle it? That's a mm-hmm. uh, um, a combination of print and professional. If you guys Thank you. hadn't figured that out, do you? He says, do you have an outside printer do a numbered run of the pieces you sell in your shop, or you do, do you print them on demand at home? If home, what type of what kind? Uh, if at home, <laughs> what type of paper and ink do you use? All of my home trials have had subpar results. So. You're mm-hmm. talking to, you're going to really get three points of perspective here. Will, what do you do? I'm not selling prints much anymore. I did have a huge... Yeah, when you were big into the print business, yeah. how'd you handle it? I, um, I, I had a print professional handle it. And the reason was, I hate printers. I, I know me, and I'm not a technical troubleshooting type of guy. If a printer mm-hmm. stops working, it gets the office space treatment. And mm. if you don't know what that means, go to YouTube, just type in office space printer. That'll answer mm-hmm. that question. I have no patience for printers when they don't work. So for me, it was like a way to pre- preserve my sanity. Um, and mm-hmm. it was worth paying a little extra to have someone else totally do it. The other thing is it's a lot of time um, to to print out your own prints it's if the 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 printer i was using i had like 150 different prints so they had all my files and all i had to do was send an email with the number of the 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 SKU number of the the print and the quantity and then i'd get an email back saying got it we're on it and i go pick it up done and they were beautiful i found a printer that had the great paper um and, and really good equipment, and I never had any complaints. They were ready for shows whenever we were ready, and that's how I mm-hmm. handled it. So, um, but boy, this would this would be a good question for Lee because he loves his printers, his new one. Yeah, he so did, Anthony, he, you'll have to answer for Lee. Well, I will. It's yeah, what I do your, here. Let's hear your, your thought. <clears throat> So my perspective on this has changed a lot over this last, what, four or five years. So when I, when full-time as a creative, I really wanted to kind of control every part of my creative process. And part of that was buying my own printer, sourcing my own ink, testing all sorts of papers. You know, I'm primarily a watercolor illustrator. And so I really wanted to try to recreate my prints uh, mm-hmm. or uh, my, my watercolor pieces as watercolor prints. And I really wanted to control that aspect of everything. I think the challenge, and I think I, I think Will's totally right, is I, I think the hard part is the technology sometimes lag, sometimes at home lags behind what we truly need and deserve. And I've ended up fighting with my printers sort of more than anything. Um, Over the last couple of years, I've upgraded my home printer. And uh, in rereading the question here, you know, about home trials and subpar results, I think think there's got to be a point where you really have to, if you want to print from home, you have to invest an awful lot into the technology and a really good sort of high-end prosumer level printer, uh, OEM inks directly from the manufacturer, and then good paper. And it's a it's an alchemy of all of that. I will say, though, we've had this question come up on some of my live streams. Uh, despite mm-hmm. me printing at home, uh, my recommendation for somebody is probably to look at the print professional level. I think you really have to analyze... Like, what's your print volume? How many prints are you going to be making? Um, How big is your sales funnel? Uh, Do you have a really, really big sales funnel or is it kind of small? And I think, I also think you have to sort of analyze, like, 
how much control do you really have to have over the process? Mm -hmm. uh, do you have to have your fingers on every component of it? Uh, or are you better off just handing those files over, making sure they're, they're put in the right file type, and letting mm -hmm. a professional absolutely knock it out of the park? I think I think those are really big key considerations. And so despite having a, a really nice, you know, high-end Canon printer behind me, if my mm -hmm. print volume gets any better than what it is now, and we're, we do anywhere between sort of 10 and 30 prints a week right now, um, I have to outsource it because it's, yeah. it's just, it's too much effort. Um, luckily, in my case, this printer is really good. It manages itself. You don't have to do very many cleaning cycles. The inks are really great, um, but it's a lot. It's a lot to what's maintain. Your, what kind of printer is it? I mean, what's it's a Canon, the... Yeah, it's a Canon Pro 1000. So it's their, okay. It's a $1,300 machine. Uh, all 12 of the ink set is uh, to buy it at cost is $600. Um, but it will last. I mean, I've, I've made thousands of prints on it so far. Full bleed, edge to edge, mm -hmm. 11 by 14. Wow. Um, I think the other tricky part, too, is... And we sometimes miss think about, well, the printer just does its job, but your monitor has to be calibrated and you know you need to understand color settings and color profiles. That's stuff mm -hmm. that a printer is gonna help you with. And that's stuff yeah. that a that a printer is gonna say, put it in this color profile, export it as this, and we will do the rest. And uh, before I let uh, Jake uh, take it, I used to be such a snob about all of this. And I think either as I've gotten older or just less attention or just see my friends just make amazing prints at FedEx and Kinko's and local print shops, I don't think that the customers care about it nearly as much as we think they're going to care about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think when I was making these luxurious Gicli watercolor prints that cost me four or five dollars a unit my customers didn't care no one mm -hmm. cared you bring mm -hmm. those to a, com a comic con and you try to explain all the features and benefits of those and their eyes just roll to the back of their head they just want their harry potter print and they just want to yeah. on, you know <laughs> yeah. you know I, look, can if i can add on to that really quick yeah, because i didn't it. include this part you're right about the quantity I mean, we were printing low end, you know, 400 prints and high end around a thousand every time. And that is a lot of prints. So, and the price, I got the price down because of that. So, yep. Yep. So, yeah. So for, so for me, if I'm printing at home, I've got my raw costs in an 11 by 14 print, full bleed edge to edge around a dollar 50 to a dollar 75. Uh, to take that to a print shop, even a, um, just a sort of a medium local print shop. Uh, with really nice paper, it's about 75 cents to a dollar. Um, yeah. You just have to consider the volume. Like I enjoy a little bit of the one-off, uh, but now I'm adding 30 new prints to my store for 2023. And that's too much. It's just too much for me to manage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I've, I used to lean in hard on prints. I've, I've since backed off on it. Um, I've always just printed them at home unless it's for a Kickstarter. And I know, you know, already that I need to print over a thousand, you know, to, to give the backers. And then I'll usually go to a, a print shop. But if it's like, <clears throat> you know, if it's a, a couple of week that need to go out, you know, it's just easy for me to click a button and, and print it. And so, um, I'm not a stickler on color. I don't hold up the print to the monitor and to make sure everything's good could because, you know, as long as it's close, I, I'm happy with it. And, yeah. uh, and I'll, sh I'll ship that out. And, um, um, uh, I don't know if I have like color blindness or, or, or I've this finished, not perfect mentality, but, um, yeah, getting, you know, unless it's wildly different, I don't worry about color profiles or anything like that. And I just, you know, I, I assume that the person who is going to be hanging this up in their, in their house has different lighting than the lighting in my office. They have different colored walls than the walls in my office. It doesn't matter if the shade is, uh, you know, a blue is a hair darker or a hair lighter because it's going to look different anyway, yeah. wherever they, they end up hanging it up. So, um, so that's, you know that's just the way I approach it, and uh, and I think I think uh, I think 
Anthony was right. Like figure out and, and will too, like figure out what your personality is and what your needs are. And it sounds like Micah that you should just go with a print professional. Um, if, if, if it's a huge headache for you. So I would, and like, and, and, and luckily too, even a small local print shop or even one of the big national chains, like a FedEx Kinko's, Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, because they've got a big name, sometimes we might underestimate the kind of sort of niche quality that they can provide. Mm-hmm. I think what's what's nice is you can get a small quantity. You don't have to be locked in to get a thousand prints so you right. get them all for a nickel. You can get 10 or 20 of each SKU or each item mm-hmm. and that could be really sufficient. And then as you get bigger and bolder and better and your sales funnel gets really big, you can just recalibrate. You can just recalibrate. I was always so nervous that if I printed on a certain kind of paper for my series of prints, and then I switched the paper or I switched the ink type or I switched anything, my customers wouldn't come back. Those re- mm-hmm. those amazing repeat customers, it's not stopped anybody. As long right. as the as long as the product is professional and you get it there and it's perfect every time, like in terms of like how it's shipped, they don't care. Yep. All right. Next one: Kickstarter versus pre-order on a website. Uh, Loney says, I love the podcast, a question I've had for a while. I'm wondering about the benefits of using Kickstarter versus just doing pre-orders on your own website, especially if a person has a social media following and is driving a lot of traffic themselves like you three are with your projects. What are the benefits of still using Kickstarter and paying their fees? Thanks. All right. All three of us here have launched a Kickstarter uh, mm-hmm. and all three of us here have an online shop or have dabbled in that. Um, mm-hmm. have you, have e- either of you done like a, a pre-order for a product that you probably could have kickstarted? Mm-hmm. Okay. Why'd you do that? That's it. Yeah, that's a good question. So I've, I've launched a couple of, um, print products in this last handful of years. Three years ago, I released a, a, a my first art book. I put that on Kickstarter. Um, I had a good size following on social media. I think that project was, um, we funded it on day one, and I think that project ended up about eleven, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. So it was perfect for me and t- sort of where I was in that capacity. Um, we got about $1,000 worth of extra um, Kickstarter only support that people just found it on the, on that page. Um, I also le- released a sketchbook in this last year. My audience is double the size of what it was a few years ago. It's a blank sketchbook. It's a really good, high quality product. Uh, for whatever reason, I just really wanted to do a pre-order and then just launch it off of my website. Uh, we launched it really strong. We paid for it within the first week or two. Uh, in terms of the the total raw costs that I put into it. Um, and that one, I just, I don't know, it was, it was just kind of strange. I just didn't feel like I needed to do a Kickstarter. I almost didn't want to make it that big of a deal. Um, mm-hmm. Thinking about sort of the, the second art book, which is a product that I'm working on right now, I will likely go back to Kickstarter for it. And that's but I, I, and again, I'll, I'll defer back to you guys. I mean, this is a conversation that Jake and I have had previously, and I think he's got, he, I think he's got really good thoughts that sort of are making me rethink why I would go Kickstarter versus not. But we'll see. Yeah. What about you, Will? I think if you if you have a product that can go really wide uh, on Kickstarter, and it's it's good for that that audience, you have to remember that Kickstarter isn't great for every product because um, Kickstarter demographic tends to lean more male and younger, like maybe, you know, 20s to 30, 40s, you know. Um, If you have a product that's geared towards, let's say, the elderly or 55 plus group, probably not a good idea to go to Kickstarter, you know. If you Mm -hmm. have a children's book, Unless the niche is something that is going to appeal to that Kickstarter crowd, probably not a good, great platform. Um, so it really depends to me. And in fact, the, 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 the book that I launched that I talked about, Pickleball Paul, not going to Kickstarter for that very reason. <clears throat> um, and, 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 and a Kickstarter is it's a lot of work 
Um, now, there's there's just a lot of work to launch your own, um, you know, on your own website and to do your own personal launch as well. And a lot of the same tasks you'll probably do for each one. But uh, managing a Kickstarter is is a, is quite the task. You're not, you know, you're on their platform. Everything is 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 kind of you have to kind of follow the protocols of that have been established, not necessarily by Kickstarter, but by the community of people who have adopted Kickstarters. And there's a kind of a cultish um, a set of norms that you kind of mm-hmm. have to abide by. And if you don't, you'll throw off your 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 customers, your you know your backers. Um, and so I, I think the, 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 probably the biggest reason to use Kickstarter is to take advantage of their algorithm where, you know, they, the more sales that you bring them. And I, and I, I talk about this in my book, um, the complete Kickstarter playbook is, uh, you bring them sales. They, they, um, their algorithm is such that they owe you sales from their organic side. So the more sales that you can bring in, you know, all the people on your social media that you direct there will create a a deficit of sales that they need to bring you that you didn't get on your own. They're remember, they're trying to stay relevant. So they, they know that they have to provide value to people that want to use their platform or else people will just do their own personal launch. Right. So, so the, so the advantage of using Kickstarter really is to gain those sales that you couldn't get on your own, but, but that the people who are going to Kickstarter to just basically like check it out and see what's new, what's going on. They stumble across yours. They, and then some of them buy it and you get sales that you wouldn't have gotten on your own. Yeah. What do you, what do you think of your last couple of projects? Cause you've had some, some wildly successful things that you've kickstarted. How much of that traffic, those sales came organically from Kickstarter versus mm-hmm. other advertising means that you brought into it? So, yeah, we could, and we broke that down on the, on the, uh, what they don't teach in art school book. Yeah. It was, um, right around half, half of the sales were organic were, were Kickstarter sales that we didn't get. Um, and then the other half was, it, it's actually more like 40%, I think were organic. And then, um, the ads that I ran through backer kit, um, brought in, uh, 30% of the sales. So, okay. I, so about 30% came from, from ads and then another 30% from the people that I brought. So there's, there's, there's different ways to leverage and those, you know, the, the, the ads, there's a double-edged sword again, that if you talk to, to people who have launched, uh, board games, board games do really, really well on Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And can. some of the yeah. board game companies, um, have, you know, see these massive numbers. I mean, some seven figure numbers and they all basically say the only way you can get to those kinds of numbers are to use the, um, the the ads that are placed on your behalf by um, these funding companies who who spend their own money on ads and they they generate ads they make ads they A/B test ads for you um, and you know a lot of those ads go on Instagram some of them go on Facebook mm-hmm. some of them go YouTube but um, but yeah so you know but going big on anything there's, there's a huge cost, right? There's, there's a lot of costs involved and there's a lot of, you see that number, those huge numbers. And, but what you don't see is how that money is parsed out at the end of the day. And sometimes having a simpler life and selling a 10th of what you would sell through a big campaign can, can almost net the same results. Sometimes it really depends. You just, you just don't know how successful you're going to be on Kickstarter when things take off and do really, really well, sometimes creators make a ton of money, and that you wouldn't do if you were doing it on your own platform. You know, I think you. So. It's really interesting as I even think about this for myself. I think if you like your, um, you know, the 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 art school book, um, mm-hmm. you know, that's such a that's such a wide 
product that is really relevant to a mass of people. You know, I think about like my first art book, which was a very niche individual Anthony Wheeler character design, you know, and that and that did fine. That did we, you know, again, about 10 percent of our sales were Kickstarter, extra Kickstarter. Um, thinking about it, though, my sketchbook, my blank sketchbook probably would have been a better product to kickstart because mm. it is such a generic, far reaching, wide p- product um, that is not back to me, you don't have to care about me. You just need an incredibly competent product to, to draw in. And mm-hmm. that probably would have been a better thing to kickstart than, a, than an art book where I could have brought. But again, both projects are great. And I did really mm-hmm. great on both of them um, mm-hmm. from my, by my standards. Um, but it's, I, I guess I had not really thought about that in terms of the, the marketability, both of the individual versus the, the, the product that is so perfect for the masses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think for me, I've done I've done both. I've done the pre-orders. I've tried to mimic Kickstarter as closely as possible on my web web store, um, online shop, where I've even had like a countdown clock. And the Kickstarters just always do better because yeah. people there's just a psychological thing. There's this inherent. Um, uh, yeah sort of like uh what, what you know there's this like need to what's the word i'm looking for there's this um urgency, urgency. Yeah, exactly there's just like a fear of missing urgency out too. right yeah. yeah and so and and there's the comments happening on it and there's the easy way to share it and um and people just have been and able to wrap like 24 hours left yeah, 24 hours left down to, you know, we're at, we're at 1,100 backers and it's all very forward facing and outward facing. Whereas your shop, you know, you have to go into the back end and say, oh, we've got 500 people who've pre ordered this book. Do you want to join them? And it's, it's just not an event. And so, um, mm-hmm. and so that's why I like the Kickstarters. There's fees involved, but I always, it's always worth the fees because like I'm looking at this last book, Kepler's Guide to Spaceships. And 52% of the pledges, it made 86,000. 52% were um, pledged via Kickstarter. Um, 43% pledged via external referrers. And 4% pledged via custom referrers. I actually don't know what a custom referrer is. Do you guys know what that is? (laughs) Um. (laughs) That's a good... That's a good little mm. researcher I should no. research I, I should do. But uh, but I go to this and it's like, you know, that's that's a whole lot of money that you're leaving on the table when you do a pre yeah, pre order. Now the other factor is Kickstarter works best when you have for for a book or for a sketchbook or something like that. You know, something that's very much branded to you. It works best if you have an online audience to support you. Uh, because they're going to show up day one to back the, you know, show their support and to back it. And, and the trick to Kickstarter is, is you set that day, you set your goal at a level that, um, you know, you could fund it within 24 hours because then that tells Kickstarter's algorithm. This is a very popular product. They're going to make more money, the more money that they invest in promoting it. And so it's uh, it's essentially uh, like a feedback loop of because it's successful, it gets more successful. Because it's more successful, it gets even more successful, and they, they you know they they um, they advertise it more. So all of that stuff is like it's worth the you know ten percent cut that Kickstarter and credit card fees take. You know, uh, and so I think I think it's I think it's good to do that you know, Will and, and Anthony bring up good points in that, you know, maybe you don't have time in your life to do a Kickstarter, but you do need, you know, you could sell a couple hundred copies of this thing that you're putting out. So yeah, just throw it in the shop and and take those orders and, and do it. And I've done that for any time I launch a new print. I don't run a Kickstarter for a new print. Or um, mm-hmm. I usually do a Kickstarter for something that it really is. There's some upfront costs to getting it made. Because mm-hmm. a book isn't cheap, um, you know. Uh, and then the I would the other part of the culture of Kickstarter is the 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 add-ons and the different tiers and stuff like that. So 
you know, I look at um, Lorenzo doing his How to Think When You Draw books, right? And every time he launches a new book, there's a tier where you can get all previous yeah. copies of it plus the other ones. It's and genius. it's like a, you know, some mm-hmm. of these tiers are $400. And, and if you're rolling up, and this is your first time seeing this Kickstarter and you're like, Oh my gosh, these books are amazing. I want to like get the whole set. Like it's, it's very compelling, uh, to, to, you know, proposition to like get all these books in one shipment. You don't have to pay for shipping multiple times and to, and to just have it done. So I say Kickstarter is definitely the way to go if you're going big on something and, 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 um, and I would definitely consider it. Now, I launched Drawings One as a Kickstarter. That project did fifty or sixty thousand, and then Drawings Two. I was like, I want to see what I could do on my online shop, and so I went and launched that on the online shop. It didn't do as well as as the Kickstarter, but it still did fine. I was happy with it, mm-hmm. and so happy enough that I did three and four as just online shop pre orders. Mm. Um, and, uh, and, and that, that did great. And I sort of had this, I made an email list of everybody who had backed my Kickstarter before. So I just emailed them out and said, Hey, I'm doing pre-orders if you want to get this. And then I would just sell those books over time, right? At cons and things like that. Um, it had been a couple of years before, uh, since I'd done that, uh, since I'd done the last drawings four when I launched the Kickstarter for drawings five. And that was me saying, Let's see if we can like jumpstart this uh, this drawings book stuff again. And so I launched that. It had a different style cover. It was a sort of a different book in that it had a comic in it. It had a tutorial in it, and uh, and I thought I was offering something a little bit more different uh, than what I'd done before. And so I I felt like kickstarting it would was a good move, and that book did did as well as the first book. Right. So I was back up to those first book numbers. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's, that's sort of like at the end of the, at the end of the day, just take a, take a look at how many online followers you have, take a look at sort of the time and the schedule, scheduling you could put into it. I uh, usually takes me about a month to prep for a Kickstarter yeah. and then you're really doing not much else reasonable during the mm-hmm. Kickstarter. So it's two months it's a, of your it's life. It's a huge distraction. And then... It's a couple of weeks for fulfillment. So, so, you know, if you can get two and a half months worth of, of payment out of that, I guess, reimbursement for that time, then go for it. If not, just do the, just do the, uh, the pre-order. Mm-hmm. At, at one point, Jake and I were talking about Kickstarters and I had said, if, well, if I come back to Kickstarter uh, for this next project, I only want to do a, a two week Kickstarter. And Jake was like, no, <laughs> like, why, why do you want to do two weeks versus a month? And in my end, because it is such a big distraction on your life. Uh, I was like, well, what if I shorten the pain just in these two, <laughs> two little itty bitty weeks. And then we talked about his numbers in terms of the, uh, the most recent projects and that just on, even in those slow weeks and that, that dip in that middle is really mm-hmm. slow sometimes, but that was enough extra income, uh, on that project day by day, even in the slowest period of that, of that four week Kickstarter that Jake had run, that it was like, yeah, it's a no brainer. Like even if, yeah. even if we have a couple of slow days and things aren't pushing, uh, there's enough visibility that continues to come. And especially to Will's point, if Kickstarter's doing, doing its reciprocal job in giving you back what you're giving to them. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. All right. Should we do the next Good answers, question? guys. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't argued yet, though. When does the arguing happen? We need something to argue about. <laughs> we, yeah, pickles? we should. We, we, what about pickles? Oh. How do, you, do you guys feel like pickles are good? Uh, you know what? I don't like the sweet ones, but I like the the butter pickles. Okay. I only do pickles sort of on sweet. a hamburger, and that's it. Every other pickle's nasty. So again, I pickles are trash. I, I unless you guys <laughs> are sponsored by Dill. Uh, like the dill pickle industry, like I hate pickles. I just I can't eat them. They're gross. Really? Yeah. So, so do you, don't yeah. you ever just want a big dill? Nope. Nope. The crunchy Clausen nope. dill pickle. No, How about this? Let's drink let's, some uh, 
let's let's really get into the weeds on something. Is <laughs> Palestine a state? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> wow. That's in Ooh. Iowa, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> let's yeah, go to right. the next question. Okay, Asia. This may, name may sound familiar if you've attended any of our recent critique arenas. Uh, she's a she submits she's a hard at least worker. three yeah. pieces every time. Yes, she says, "Oh, the terror! Scared of success, don't want to be a quitter." She says, "Hello, beautiful people. Three-year-old rabbit here. Thank you for all the work that you guys do. I've learned so much and grown artistically. I'm feeling really, really good about where I'm at with my illustration style and work pace, and and I, I have seen a lot of growth as well. So mm -hmm. doing some good stuff. Um, but that also brings forward new fears. I haven't acquired any professional work yet, and I'm okay with that for now because I'm actually terrified of success in all caps." My question is, once you've entered a contract, what happens if you can't complete the job? What happens if you can't hold up your end of the bargain, whether it's something beyond your control or not? Uh, will that put a mark against you or a red flag for future potential clients? I ask because I'm medically unstable, suffering from severe migraines and ultra severe anxiety. And I'm worried that I might disappoint people because I get overwhelmed easily. What's a girl to do? On a side note, I've attached my Instagram link. You may think I'm not even ready and I'm worrying for no reason yet. So I'm going to, I'm going to pull this up and we can look at that while we talk. Um, uh, yeah. So this is a very, very valid concern. Um, I have a, a son who deals with migraines and some anxiety and, you know, he has a, a special considerations for school. You know, he's allowed to take as many days off as he needs to without it affecting his, um, you know, his, uh, what's the allotment of days off that a kid can have before, you know, it's, it becomes a problem. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I understand that this is, this is something pretty serious. So I think what you do here is, and, and if you're viewing this on YouTube, you could see Asia's work. As I'm scrolling through it on Instagram, we are our channel is the Society of Visual Storytelling. School visual storytelling. Now. I'm sorry. Yep. School. Um, I think you kind of dip your toe into the water and you grow as as you do one project. You see how that goes. You see what you can handle. You take on a little more. See how that goes. See what you can handle, and just and and you don't have to like attack it hard you know with uh you know like like just getting into the grind 100 percent. i think you can just just take on as little as you need in the first place and kind of go about it that way because it, it is true if you do not deliver on a project um and you miss a deadline and you throw off a publisher um they take note of that and they may love your work but they need more than they love your work. They need someone reliable. And so, mm -hmm. uh, definitely don't commit to anything that you, that you can't do doing the critique arenas and just work. Like the fact that you're able to submit a handful of illustrations every time, you know, that is good practice for the professional doing a professional job and, and living in a professional world of the illustration. Right. So I would keep doing, that kind of stuff. Um, and, and I don't know, do you guys have a different take on, on that? Any, any different advice you might give? I, I'm not going to pretend to know what it's like to have migraines or high anxiety, but I can, I would have, for me, when I have been anxious about, um, projects and I have had quite a few where I've gotten the job, this is early on, and been so excited and then gone, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? That's like I got every this project. Right. right. <laughs> I'm not qualified. I'm not really an illustrator. Like, who am yeah. I kidding? Um, I don't know if I really belong doing this and, and, and panic, you know, like, am I going to be able to come up with good ideas? Are, is the, are the, when I send in sketches, you know, and you horribleize, right. And then, 
Are they going to go, yeah. this isn't what we had in mind at all. Why did we even hire you? So you have all these <laughs> this negativity that, that runs through you. The only thing I can say is that through my entire life, from the time I was a little child, I have built on experiences. And one of the earliest experiences I can remember was getting this stupid award called the Paul Bunyan Award in scouting. And mm -hmm. uh, it's where you, you cut down a tree. Uh, I don't know if they do it anymore because you have to kill a tree. <laughs> but this was back when it was okay to kill trees. When we um, had plenty of them. <laughs> when we had plenty of them. Yeah, so you cut down a tree. You cut a four-foot section. This is with an axe. And the tree is pretty ramp, big around. It was like 10 inches um, diameter, you know. Um, and then uh, you cut a four-foot section out, so you have to cut it again. And then you have to quarter those sections. And what, by the time I was done, the, these, these older kids, they were like, they picked one of us, you know, and they picked me. They're like, we think this kid might be actually have a chance at doing it. And, uh, you know, I was like 10 or 11 years old. My hands were bloody by the time I was done. Mm -hmm. Literally just blisters that had popped open and... Were you trying to chop Tons the tree, tree down with your hands, with your fingers? Yeah. <laughs> was punching it. They didn't give That's you an right. axe in Scouts? Okay. I okay. saw the axe later and I realized <laughs> I, you know. Uh, but uh, but that experience, I leveraged that into, you know, I, I did it. I, yeah. I finished it. I got the award. Everybody yeah. was super impressed. And then uh, later on, my dad asked me to remove the sod off of the front hill in our house so we could plant ivy there. And he's like, this is going to take you a long time. I don't think you'll be able to do it. I actually thrive when people tell me that, you know, mm -hmm. don't think you'll be able to do it. And uh, it took me um, two weeks going out there every day, working in the hot sun. By the way, I have to, when it, when it's, you know, time to do a podcast, I have to text them. I'm like, I don't think you could show up on time for this podcast. Well, <laughs> That's right. I, I, really I don't think don't you're going to have a good idea. Psychology. You're not going to be able to concentrate for the podcast. So, <laughs> so yeah, I got that done. And that and then later on, there's, there's times where I've climbed, not, I was never a mountain climber, but I've climbed mountains that, you know, I thought, I don't think I'm going to make it to the top of this thing. But you draw on the past things that you've accomplished where you thought you couldn't do it. And you did it, and so I think, I think that that might be uh, helpful here, where you you know you take on some small ones, making sure that you have a deadline that's far enough off that if you get a migraine and if you uh, on some of those days are just suffering from high anxiety, you can know that you have time to get it done still. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But but getting some of those done, I mean, your work is is great. Yep. I know you could do it, um, and I think a lot of people at SVS learn that know you and that have been in the competitions would expect that you'd have no problem working for clients with the, with your talent level and your abilities, mm -hmm. and um, you know, so you just need to, to prove it to yourself. I think. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting how you say you're not, you, you don't have a lot of high anxiety because I am an incredibly anxious person. Um, I came to illustration very, very late. I didn't go to art school. I was a hobbyist for, you know, an enormous amount of time. And, um, and so there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of fear. There's been a lot of anxiety. There's been depression in this last handful of years. And there's been a lot of self doubt and really critical thinking and perhaps over critically thinking of myself um, and, and it's interesting, you know, reading her message because I, I feel like, you know, there's some similarities there. And I think for me, what really stood out was, uh, sometimes do you need to take that work? Do you need mm -hmm. to, uh, to seek outside client work? And if so, why? Is it the money? Is it the validation? Is it the experience? Is it, is it a dream? You know, for me, I've uh, recognizing my anxiety and my fears, I've really kept my practice kind of small and I've kept it very independent. And I've really built uh, my illustration career sort of outside of the big publishing houses. Um, and I've stacked successes. And that, I think that's what Will's talking about, too, is all those little successes start to add up and add up and add up. And over time, you can see just how far you've been able to go and how far you've been able mm -hmm. to come. 
Um, and I think I, I think for anybody in a situation like that, I think they have to really define like what is the real m- meaning or measure of success? Is mm-hmm. it working for somebody or working for yourself? And is it maybe doing a little bit of both? And I think what works sometimes today, it's okay if it doesn't work six months from now. It's okay mm-hmm. if it's just it's not a good fit. Um, and I think you know, at home here, we talk a lot about permission and giving yourself permission. Well, I think sometimes somebody needs to tell you that you can give yourself permission to A, succeed and B, give up if it's not working. Not all the Mm -hmm. time, but sometimes you need to know where you need to pull back and say, this just isn't it right now. And, Mm -hmm. and we can do that. We don't always have to hard charge and, and prove to ourselves or prove to somebody else. Um, one thing I will say, considering the the anxiety, is I think it's totally fair if somebody moves and starts taking on client work to really, really define with the client who you are, how you work, how you operate, mm-hmm. and what's important to you. And if a client isn't interested in hearing it, I think you have a great idea that it's not a great client. If a client is really going to be uh, on your level and understand what's important to you, and you guys can come up with a really thoughtful plan together, it's, it, mm-hmm. it's a, the makings of a very good fit. Um, I think the other thing, and I saw this in executive recruiting before I left art, is I think acknowledging the fears, the anxiety, the, the, the scariness of the whole thing, but then understanding what your levers for your own personal success are. So what, what do you physically or mentally or emotionally need to be able to do to, to give you so, yourself a successful day? Is it plotting out your calendar? Is it lighting your favorite candle so you know it's go time? Like, mm-hmm. candles on, time to work. Uh, mm-hmm. Is it eliminating all of the outward distractions so you put your headphones on? Uh, is it is it planning out this week we need to hit this milestone, next, next week we need to hit this milestone? Every lever is going to be completely different. And sometimes the, the client isn't going to give you enough time to allow you to create all of your own individual levers. So you're going to have to sort of play within that and, that. and that can be kind of tough. But those are decisions that you have to make once that work starts to become more apparent and, and things like that. Um, but I think really being able to identify clear levers of success for you and how you operate and how you want to operate and then trying to fit in where you can, I think, is, is probably where we need to start. But beyond that, I would not be scared just to just to build a really strong individual practice. Don't worry mm-hmm. about the big clients. Clients come and go. Clients mm-hmm. come and go. Um, build, build exactly what you can build on your own with your time. And then these other opportunities will just literally fall in your lap. It, it really is true. I, I, I think that's great advice. Like <clears throat> you have to figure out, I think for, a lot of times we chase these, um, these jobs or these, this, this, uh, this like vision of who a, an artist is or an illustr a working illustrator is when we don't actually know if that fits our personality and our abilities and, and our needs, right? Yeah. And so <clears throat> the advice I've been given lately, you know, to people that I run into at like conferences or, you know, um, whether it's SVS Learn or, or whatever, is is this, the, the Venn diagram of these three different things where those overlap, where these three things overlap, that's what you need to focus on. That's where you fit. And that's the question I always ask myself, where do I fit? Where do I fit? And what those three things are, it's what, uh, let's see, it's who do you serve? Who do you want to serve? It's how do you work? Okay. And it's what can you make? So who do you want to serve? How do you, how do you work and what can you make? And who do you want to serve? I'll just break down that down really quick. Do you primarily just want to create art for yourself? Do you just want to serve yourself with your art? Mm -hmm. That's a very different thing than serving a fan base or serving an employer. Those are three different, different approaches to art, right? One's more of a um, hobbyist and one's more of a, you know, there's showmanship involved into it. If you're trying to do fans and then um, for an employer, (coughs) you you really have to impress a very small pool of people instead of a very large pool of people 
with um, with the fan base, right? And then how do you work? This is where you take into account um, uh, your abilities, the skills you've acquired, your your disabilities, you know, your your liabilities, right? All mm-hmm. these things that are in your favor, your privilege, and and all the things that like take away from from what you're able to do, and taking all those into factor, it might be like, well, geez, I, you know, I could only work eight hours a week due to everything that's going on in my life. Um, maybe I'll just be happier serving myself with my art. I'm essentially just saying what you said, Anthony, pretty much. And then it's, what was the other one? Uh, what can you, so that's more like, what can you make? And then how do you work is, is, are you a collaborative person or are you a person who's very self-directed and, and needs, uh, you know, uh, kind of there's friction when there's other people involved in the process, or you're very much a, a per- people pleaser and you like, you want to be told what to do and, and you want to, you know, perform all of those factors need to go and come into place. And once you can figure that out, then you can decide, okay, am I ready to be a pro um, I have these very specific needs that I need fulfilled. And then you can, and this figuring this out where all these things overlap helps you everywhere from what do you focus on in mastering your craft, how you should market yourself and what kind of lifestyle you, you want to be living. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, do I want to show up every day at the office or do I want to work in my pajamas at home? Right. Um, and so, yeah, there just needs to be some some of that sort of questions that you need to ask yourself. We should probably come up with a sheet, like answer these questions, and then this will tell you what you're <laughs> what you're uh, set up to do. But um, and it's okay too if things change, and that's and and I think that's mm-hmm. one thing that we underestimate in our society is that we sometimes put ourselves in these these lanes mm-hmm. and. And we don't then allow ourselves to off-ramp or on-ramp into these other places. Um, you know, in the last handful of years, you know, beyond beyond COVID, I have a son with with, uh, with a, a neurological condition. We've had uh, babies. We've had people pass away. Uh, there's there's some times where everything just flows and works, and then there's other times where you got to get out. <laughs> you got to, mm-hmm. you got to, you got to go into a different direction for a bit. And sometimes that, that bit could be eight months or a year. You know, after my father passed away, I didn't draw for eight months. I didn't even, I didn't focus on it. And when I came back into illustration, mm-hmm. I only then thought about how to make myself happy with my art. I didn't mm-hmm. think about my audience. I didn't think about the Instagram followers. I didn't think about prospective clients. I thought, this is what I need to get the joy of illustration back. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now things are different. I'm in a pretty great spot. And, you know, I'm more emotionally stable. I'm significantly less anxious. And I've found these different lanes and avenues. But if we do this podcast again in two years, I, it might, I might be in a different spot, in a different lane, working towards a different objective. And that's okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's our um, episode for today i'll uh i'll take us out if there's anything else you wanted to add will we can do that no you guys nailed it okay let me uh let me take us out then three point perspective is made possible by svslearn.com we're becoming a great illustrator starts we just want to thank everybody for joining us today your hosts have been will terry Jake Parker, and Anthony Wheeler subbing in for Lee White. You can find Will Terry's work at willterry.com uh, and at Will Terry Art on, uh, on Instagram. You can find my work at mrjakeparker.com and at Jake Parker on Instagram. And you can find Anthony Wheeler on Twitch and on Instagram by just going to Anthony Wheeler Art, at Anthony Wheeler Art. Podcast produced by Daniel Two. That's Daniel T U, and you can find his work at Daniel Two.co. Keeper of the curriculum. Special thanks to him, Austin Shirtliff. Special thanks to Show Notes Wrangler, Lily, Lily Howell, and a special thanks to our Chief Operations Officer, Lisa Fott. Now, go draw something. Do you guys? Are you ready? Um, do you guys listen to your podcasts on one or one point? Two five or one point five or two x. Uh, one, one. What about you, Will?
one you to list, one. I, you listen I, to podcasts, right? Yeah, it's too distracting to hear the chipmunk voice. Well, let me. They, they don't. They make it so it doesn't sound like a chipmunk. It just sounds like. Did I say chipmunk? Like someone on a lot of coffee. <laughs> a chipmunk like on their fifth latte of the day. <laughs> they just speed it up. I switched to one and a quarter, and it has improved my life drastically. Yeah. Yeah, because you finish it so much faster. You have twenty five percent more time to twiddle your thumbs. Yeah. But do well, you no. think about it? Like, do you th- marinate it? Do you let it stew around you? I'll I say this: when I switch back to one, it sounds like I'm listening. See, to that's the problem. Is you want you'll make regular human interactions like, come on, come on, spit yeah. it out. You know. Yeah. Do you wish? Do you wish Will was talking up. faster? Well, right now I'm just like, yeah, does. Know, what's the, what's the setting on Will right now? Is it? <laughs> it's point six five. I'm always yeah. slow. <laughs> <laughs> So I have found, I think that's why, like, you have these guys like um, like a Ben Shapiro who just, anytime you listen to him record a uh, recording of him, it's like, yeah. and I think mm-hmm. it's that dude listens to his podcast on 3X, and now that's how he thinks he should talk. 